Good afternoon. I'm Kelly McCutcheon, President of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and we're very excited uh, to have you here in our Georgia Legislative Policy uh, Conference, and we've got a great, great uh, concluding session on education for you. We are streaming this on Facebook Live, so make sure you really ask good questions. And I want to turn it over to our moderator, Mike Dudgeon. Now, Mike and I have known each other for a long time since uh, we were at Georgia Tech together. And he is very passionate about education. He's been a very successful entrepreneur. In fact, he's the chief technology officer at High res Studios, which is a video game development uh, company, which is a pretty exciting thing. I've actually been out there to tour his facilities, and they, you know, it's a really exciting business to be in. A lot of, it's a business that a lot of people don't realize we, we uh, have thrived in Atlanta in that area. But his interest in education, obviously through his kids, got him uh, motivated enough to run for and be elected to the school board in Forsyth County. And I, I have great respect for people who want to serve on school boards. That is a tough, thankless job, but very necessary to get good people on those school boards at the local level. He then realized that so much of the policy that would drive them crazy at the local level was driven by the state level, so he ran for and was elected uh, to the state legislature, uh, the House of Representatives, until this past year when the demands of his job became so great that he just could not balance the family and the job and the legislature at the same time. So that was a great loss. He was vice chairman of the education committee, accomplished a lot of wonderful legislation while he was there, had a great impact, and I'm sure he'll continue to be very engaged in education. One reason we wanted to have him here today. One thing you might not know about Mike, that's why he's going to be a great moderator, these skills probably came in very handy in the legislature, is he is a high school referee. For many years, he's refereed both high school basketball games and now high school football games. So if you all get out of line on the panel, you might throw a flag. So please welcome Mike Dutcher. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. I was going to have a football game tonight in Mount Zion, Carrollton, but it got moved to Saturday, so I won't be in a hurry leaving here, but I appreciate that. So, you know, education is one of those things where everybody talks about it because unlike tax policy or even health care policy, most people don't have that much frame of reference for that. But everybody spent 12, 16, 17 years in school, and so everybody thinks they know how education should work. And that sometimes manifests itself poorly in the legislature because you have, in the Georgia legislature, we had 236 people which all thought they had the magic bullet and the magic bill. If we just did this, we can fix education because back when I was in school or when my kids were in school, if we did X, Y, or Z, then we got these miraculous results. And so it leaves the field open for a lot of manipulation and a lot of tinkering with education. And I think a big part of the problem is that we have not truly empowered the people who really know the education, which are our teachers, in order to do the work that needs to be done and stop tinkering with it with all the levels of bureaucracy, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So our first speaker today is Vicki Davis, who is a fantastic, innovative teacher down in Camilla. And not only she innovates in her own area, with social media, she has an enormous influence throughout the nation and the world with how to do innovative things in the classroom that really connect with the students and really make a difference. So today we're very lucky to hear Vicki present on what she's doing about being innovative and being entrepreneurial in the classroom. So Vicki, good to have you here. Thanks. Uh, hello everybody. Um, it's hard to see you guys. I'm used to seeing because that way I can call you out and fall asleep or that sort of thing. We got me on. There we go. Um, so today, I know we are streaming and we may end up having a lot of folks listening on the stream, um, but today I want to talk to you about how we can improve education. Now one thing that we need to all understand, and Mike alluded to this, neuroscience is showing us that kids' brains are wired differently than our brains. They actually scan more, they, are, uh, they have a shorter attention span. They are wired differently. So everything that you know about your education, you can't turn around 
and apply that to today's kids. You can't say, well, when I was a kid, we sat in the back of the room and they gave us a book and we studied it and we took a test and we liked it. Like, you can't say that because that's not how they're wired now. So just understand that just because something worked one way previously, we have to be different and we have to think differently. And all the structures that grew up in education grew up in a time when we were trying to have a more industrial age model. Well, now we want to have creativity. So today, the goal is to really talk about what are some of the buzzwords that when you go back to your area and you talk to educators, what are they going to be talking about? What are they going to be asking for money for? What are they, going, what are they excited about? What are the things that are really worldwide changes that people around the world are talking about? So I am from Georgia, born and bred in Georgia. I'm a farm girl. My dad is one of the few living people in the Georgia Hall of Fame. His name is James Lee Adams from Camilla. And what he did really impacted me because he was a farmer who also worked with policy and also worked with helping technology improve farming. So I kind of feel the same way. I have a blog, I have a podcast, I have a reach all over the place, um, but I'm in the classroom. So the first question I want to address is, what if? What are the things that if, if I have my wish that every single school in our whole state would have. Now, we have to think, when we think Georgia, I was in Leadership Georgia and they really emphasize that we have to think everybody. It's not enough that my child is at a good school or your child is at a good school. We have to think about all schools. So what do we wish that every single school would have? And there's a couple things. The first thing we have to understand about education is it's all about relationship. If you don't have a relationship with the children, you cannot teach them. That's what the research shows, that students will resist rules and procedures, they will resist discipline if the foundation of a good relationship is lacking. To educate, you have to relate, and that is first. Well, I have a friend, Nancy Blair. I get to interview people all over the world in my podcast um, I have called The 10-Minute Teacher, and I had her on the show a couple weeks ago. She's a principal over in Fayette County at Rising Star Middle School, and she actually had all the teachers in her school take five minutes and list every single name of every student that they could remember. They identified a pretty significant number of kids that nobody named in that five minutes. And they intentionally decided to make sure that every child in that school would have a, an adult who had a relationship with that child. What do you think happened with discipline problems? Do you think they went down or up? Y'all you know, show me a thumbs down or a thumbs up. That's how I make sure my students are awake. You think discipline problems went up or you think discipline problems went down? Yes, they went down significantly because every child had somebody they mattered to. You know, we, we have a lot of politicians in here and who do you know? You know the crazy people and you know the big supporters, right? That's who you know. That's who you think about, the people who harass you and the people who give you money and support you. This is the same for teachers. We know the, the Susie raise your hand in the front of the room, and we know Billy Bob throw a pencil at the ceiling in the back of the room. And it's easy for all of the other kids, and every child matters. Every child is important. So when we think about schools, we have to think about it's still about relationship. Now you as policy leaders, you're sitting here at the 30,000 foot view. But we have to also think about the classroom and our relationships happening. When you're visiting a school, it's nice to see the technology, but you know what impresses me when I visit a school? When I see all the kids calling the principal's name as they walk down the hall and giving them a high five and they're saying, oh, I did well on my test. When I can see they have that relationship, that is what really sparks a great school. We have to relate before we educate. That comes first. So, Remember that we can talk about everything else, but it's about relationship. That's why sometimes you may have a very popular teacher who is not A-plus in their knowledge of something, but they're getting something out of those students, and, and we have to pay attention to that relationship. So the second thing is reinvention. This is where we're going to spend most of our time, is how are teachers reinventing, and specifically how are classrooms reinventing. And there's so many exciting things that are happening in classrooms. And I just wish more teachers could do it. I mean, I have teachers come up to me all the time here in the state of Georgia. I just keynoted at the GAETC um, 
Georgia Association of Educators Technology Conference uh, this past November, and I had so many who came up and said, I love all your stuff, but I can't do any of it. I'm on a script. They tell me what I have to cover when. And I'm like, if you put me on a script, I would be gone. I wouldn't do it. I'm a, I'm, I started off in the business world. Um, I went to, went to Georgia Tech with this fellow over here and with Kelly. And I started off in the business world. Didn't plan to get into teaching. And they convinced me to go into teaching because we have three children, Kip and I. He's, he's over, sitting over here. And t our two boys have learning differences. I do not call them disabilities. I call them differences because every child learns differently. And the oldest, who one teacher told us could not learn and probably wouldn't graduate from high school, just graduated from Georgia Tech. And I was very proud of that. But we have to reinvent how we think. I think every single child can learn. Now, this is what disturbs me. Um, so the OECD reports, everybody quotes, so we're lagging in math and we're lagging in, in you know, we're lagging in all these things. Well, I actually met the guy who does the reports. I sit on the uh, panel to judge the Global Teacher Prize, the million dollar prize that the Varkey Foundation gives out. And I actually sat with the fella, um, Arthur, I think it's, um, I can't say his last name, it starts with an S, it's a long French name, um, was talking about this report. And I was sitting there thinking about these reports. And I'm kind of like going, okay, so you're the guy who decides that this is what we need to be. And it's important. We need to know math, and we need to know how to read. And I'm not saying that those reports are not valid. They're important. But what I am saying is, I really, you can't find the solution to cancer on a multiple choice test. The problems we have in today's world, so many of them are how do we relate to people? How do we get along? How do we work together? How do we do, how do we relate? How do we collaborate? How do we communicate? How do we invent new things? That's what we have to do today. And while tests are, are, are part of the equation, we have made it the whole equation. And it makes me furious because there are little bitty children who don't do well at math and don't do well at reading, but they are artists. I have a student who just started at SCAD uh, this fall and she made an amazing video. She was hired by a company up here in Atlanta, Mad Learn, as a virtual intern. So her summer job for the last two summers is she has been in Camilla, Georgia, working and telecommuting to Atlanta, connecting in that way. And that's what we need. So how can we help that creativity come up? First of all, makerspace is going to be a big word that some of you have heard of. How many of you have already heard this term? Anybody? Makerspace. Um, invention Week. Uh, creation stations, fab labs, all of these, and some communities are putting these in. Some communities are going together and buying a 3D printer for the whole town. Some libraries are transforming and putting these in. And it really sparks invention because you realize we have the ability to prototype now. People are coming up with their own products and printing them out on a 3D printer. So these are my students. Now I'm going to tell you, these are three of my rowdiest boys. Do you think I had any behavior problems with these guys? They didn't even know I existed because they were making a robot. So makerspaces are important. Libraries are reinventing. This is a, a le what they call learning commons. A lot of libraries are putting in green screens. A lot of libraries are putting in movies. They're putting in all these other things, and it's something we need to put in. This is one of my students, Morgan, who's now in Valdosta. And in her 20% time, we, we use 20% uh, time, which Google does. This, they made it famous that 20% of your time is spent exploring a project of interest to you. Well, her interest was, how do I help kids who have autism? So she had a, a Twitter account, and she did a lot of research. We actually had some teachers up from Coquit County who spent some time with us, and one of them had a child who was autistic. Do you know that Morgan got a thank you note? Uh, well, actually, it was a, a thank you tweet or a direct message. Got a thank you direct message because this mom was able to help her autistic child read because my 15-year-old student found some apps that they needed to help an autistic child. Like, that's meaning. Kids want to do things that mean something. They don't want wastebasket work. They want to matter in the world. And this kind of thing helps them matter when they can make, when they can invent. Now, this has already been alluded to, and these numbers are 2013 numbers. I'm sorry I couldn't find anything 
more recent and with you being in charge of policy, so many of you, I know you have better numbers than this, so y'all forgive me, but this was 2013 uh, census numbers that basically we have no suburban area over 80% internet access in households. This is by household, not by people, by household. So then I was playing with the math because that's what us Georgia Tech people do. And I said, okay, if everybody in the state of Georgia had at least 70.04% who had internet, how, what would that mean for the state of Georgia? And it basically means that in 2013, one out of every four households in our state did not have internet access. Okay, that means a lot. It means a lot from education. It means a lot for innovation. The greatest economic development tool that ever hit Camilla, Georgia was when our city put in um, high-speed internet. And they've done a fantastic job at CNS. They've done a great job running it. They, they're probably a successful model to follow. They and Thomasville and several other places worked together. And it really transformed my classroom. And it also means that I sit at home, I go home, I record a podcast, I do work for Microsoft and Samsung and Google, and I do work for all these companies all over the world, right from Camilla, Georgia. And I don't have to travel, and I can be a teacher too. So in, we think of the people who don't have access that we can unleash. Think of the students, think of the adults. I know that you know people don't want to play for, pay for folks to watch net, Netflix, but a lot of folks have real work to do that they need the internet for. And I know it really hurts my dad. Every time it rains, he can't do any work, and he's a farmer. So um, that's because he has it over satellite. For Scythe County, and I don't know if you were part of this, but something really interesting, they uh, had a, a public-private partnership. So they had the um, businesses in town said, okay, we know that you want your kids to have access, and we're going to sign up and say, you know what, you can come use our Wi-Fi. And they put these little stickers, and it called a free Wi-Fi zone from Forsyth County Schools. And okay, this, they didn't ask anybody for any money for this. It's a great example of how we can work together to help our kids have access to the internet um, and, and do their work and do their classwork. In D.C., they call it the homework gap. Now, teachers don't like the term the homework gap because there are a lot of teachers who believe that you don't want to have homework. And in France, from what I understand, they actually outlaw homework because homework actually gives the advantage a greater advantage because their parents actually do homework with their kids. And there are a lot who don't do homework with their kids, but there is a place for some homework, I think. But when they're talking about homework gap, it's not quite the same thing as whether you should do homework or not. So if you talk to teachers and you talk to principals and you talk to others, you know, I guess y'all are used to getting in trouble with the words you use sometimes. <laughs> Just be careful if you use the term homework gap with teachers because it kind of means a different thing to teachers. Um, and then having access in devices. So there's something called checking for understanding. So you're used to what, what teachers call summative assessment. You study a chapter, you take a test, right? Everybody used to that? You study a chapter, you take a test. Okay, well we can do something now called formative assessment. That means I can basically get in the brains of my students and understand as I am teaching them, how is the knowledge forming? Did they get what I said? Because used to say the hardest thing I teach is binary numbers. So say I'm teaching binary numbers, and what happens? Susie, raise your hand at the front of the room. I know it, I know it, let's move on. And the rest of the kids are ducking for cover, hoping I'll just move on and stop talking, right? I don't really need to understand this. Well, what you can do with formative assessment is I tell them, pull out your phones, let's see what you understand. They all put in their answers, and I, I get a little chart right at my desk I can see that Susie, raise your hand, is the only person who understood how to do that. And I need to teach it more. So I literally don't give a test until I already know over 80% of the kids know it. Well, a test should never be a surprise to a teacher that is a modern 21st century teacher. But here's the problem. Many of our teachers in the state of Georgia, number one, their kids don't have access, and number two, they haven't been trained. It's there, it's here. There's no excuse for every teacher at every school not to use this, this. And the tools are free. They just need access and you can do it on your phones. Also, I think every school should make movies. Movies are the modern essay. We got a grant because we have a great YouTube channel and I share stuff that the kids do. I've had kids, I have one student who has now gone into the movie business. I actually have three or four now. 
He's the first assistant director here in Atlanta. He's done some work on Stranger Things. He did Family Feud. He's done, he rode in the back of a car and filmed some music video for Outcast. But he actually came um, back and I had a digital film class and he helped teach me how to teach the kids how do you operate on a movie set? How does that work? And the kids make powerful things that really, we have the most scholarships of any senior class we've ever had this past year. And we really attribute it to two things. Number one, they know how to make compelling movies, and number two, they make apps. So all my kids make apps, all of them make movies, and it's not that hard to do. So making movies is important. Here's some of my students shooting from a drone. I have kids now who are doing work for farmers, who are doing work for all kinds of people with drone shoots. And how many of you have, have, have worked with any drones? Anybody? Yeah, they're just, it's huge. Businesses are hiring people. This is a great area um, to have to work. And they're getting drones they're asking for for Christmas, and then they're getting hired out to do work. So filming from drones is, is a big part of what we do also. Here's the other thing is, at my school, everybody codes. This is one of my students helping a younger student learn how to program a video game. We do something called Hour of Code, which is a nationwide emphasis um, to teach every single child how to code. And it's free, and every school can do it. So I think every, every child should be exposed to coding. Is every child going to love coding? No, of course not. Not every child likes art. I mean, don't hand me a paintbrush. So everybody has different things that they like. Um, we can't force it, and that's where I guess I come back to that testing that upsets me. My student, Rebecca, who is the most gifted artist I've ever seen, would it really upset me too much if she scored a 60 percentile on a math test? Honestly, I would really care more about her artwork and her design work because math is not her gift, and we just have to, have to shift a little bit. So this is some of my students who won a Shark Tank competition. They, they're out with Drone Zone. Um, Mark is now at Georgia Tech, and Cole actually went out of state. I was kind of sad to see him uh, go somewhere else, um, try to keep him in state. But they won and got some investment money for their app that they put on the store. And this was when they were 10th graders. Um, everybody connects. So we do global collaboration and connect with the world. But our latest project is called Mad About Mattering. I do it with... Um, Mad Learn, which is based here in Atlanta. Alethea Batia is the CEO there. But Flowery Branch works with us. It's one of the, it's the public school. And Ron Clark Academy down the road. They're collaborators. And then we have eight other schools. This past year, we had over 800 kids write apps together. So it's real important for public schools should work with private schools, should work with charter schools when we're collaborating. I just think that everybody, you know, we're studying Georgia history. Why don't we have one big massive site where all the kids go in and when you're studying about Andersonville, why don't you connect with a kid who lives there and talk about Andersonville over Skype or however you want to talk about it and then I'll teach about some things that maybe happened in Camilla. I don't know how much happened in Camilla, but a few things happened, we had, you know, uh, besides our terrible tornadoes. Um, but this is my kids getting ready to present online and they present online our first judging we had judges from Microsoft and Google and from DC and from all over the place that were judges. So we know no limits. Um, our first project we did was called the Flat Classroom Project where I collaborated with a teacher in Bangladesh and um, ended up in Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, way back when I started this, this journey um, back in 2005, 2006. And, but I'm still shocked. I go to conferences and they want me to talk about global collaboration because nobody's doing it. And there's really no reason that, that people can't do that. Uh, this is one of my students, Casey. She was in our first set of projects and her second project that she did, she has students on this team and if you could squint and read, you would see Bangladesh, Austria, China, and the US were on her team. And she was mentioned in Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. Well, Casey is now a farmer in South Georgia Working with water policy, she was just hired. Um, it's one of the, I think it, she's the head of the Conservation District's organization for Georgia now. And she learned how to collaborate. So she is farming and working with water policy and living in Camilla because distance means nothing to her because she understands how to use technology. And if you live in a rural, how many of you are in rural Georgia? Anybody, a few of you? And then the rest of you are in, in more suburban. 
if you're, some of you aren't going to raise your hand. I know what's happening. Okay? Atlanta folks. So a lot of Atlanta folks. But hey, even Atlanta folks, you get some great value and diversity in your organization when you can have telecommuters from other places. So Casey, um, this is Miller. Miller. Um, Miller was named one of the top students at University of Georgia. She was one of our lead collaborators. She was a project manager in high school, leading an app team, uh, leading a team of kids um, around the world. Now she's uh, at the Medical College of Georgia. I saw her Friday night and about to be a doctor and doing amazing work. And I'll tell you, kids who collaborate and connect and use technology, they are different. They do amazing things. Now there's something else I wish every school in the state of Georgia had, and that's game-based learning. Now Ron Clark probably does it best, and if you've never seen his school, you really should. He is one of the best educators on the planet. Um, how many of you have actually read the Harry Potter books? Anybody read any of them? You know how they separate into houses? Okay, that's what they do on the first day at Ron Clark Academy. They spin a dial, they have four houses, you see all the different colored shirts? They have four houses, they have a year-long competition. There are actually a lot of folks who are doing this now, and I was talking to Kip in the car, and he said, they've been doing that in England for years. But it, there's a way that you can make learning a game. And uh, my eighth grade keyboarding class, they have houses, and we have a whole gamified thing we use called Classcraft, and it is literally a game, and nobody really understands it. Uh, because like, oh no, I did that wrong, I just got damaged. And, and so other adults don't understand the little language, but I'll tell you this, the kids run to class and they love what I teach them because we have turned it into a game. And, it's, and I wish that for every school. I also am greatly disturbed by what's happened in our kindergartens everywhere, including we have over-standardized kindergarten. I'm gonna tell you, if you could pass something that requires to, to pull back some of the, the ridiculousness of standards with kindergarten, I think everybody would applaud you. If you could require that kindergartners get to play a certain amount every day, we worry about creativity dropping. When we sit there and we have kids in the classroom all day long and they are three and four, they are wired to play, especially our little boys. You wanna know why we're having behavior problems and an increase in suspensions at that age? It's because we're putting them in a desk all day. I mean, what four-year-old is made for a desk? And I'll tell you this, a lot of parents are very angry right now across the country about what's happening in our kindergartens. Um, it's really a sore spot for a lot, a lot of parents. And then the other thing is little Johnny struggles in reading. What do they do? And he's ADD. But what do they do? I'm going to hold you back from PE or recess and make you read. Come on, little Johnny needs PE and recess more than anybody else. So these are some things, though, that the pressure of testing has caused real, what I call educational malpractice. It's not the teacher's fault. We have amazing teachers in this state. We have a lot of great people. But there are some things that are fundamentally flawed and wrong that need to change. Um, physical exercise is important in uh, Texas. They went and studied the impact of physical exercise on learning. And they had a whole school that came in and had recess first thing. Then they taught them math. And do you know their math scores went up? So physical activity and learning go together. Okay? And then here's another hot button. It's knowing their strengths. So all of my 10th uh, graders, you have to wait till after they go pu through puberty pretty much to give this type of test. But we give them, a, it takes about four hours, and we give them a test to find all of their strengths. You can look it up, it's U Science, Y-O-U Science. I took it and I learned ab about me. It's an amazing tool. But we're looking at their strengths because here's one of the things that we've been doing. We said every child is gonna be amazing at math. Every child is gonna be amazing at reading. Well, some kids are not wired for math. Well, when you find their strengths, what I care about is if you are great at math, are we making you better at math? And do you meet the minimum requirements so that when my husband hires you and you go work in a factory that you know what you know, an inch is or a millimeter is and you don't say, where's the multiple choice test that has happened to him? You know, where's the multiple choice test that gives me the measurements to pick from on this ruler? I'm like, oh, this is the real world, this is a factory. We have to measure stuff, <laughs> you know? So do we know kids' strengths? Do we know what they're great at and are we helping them? Now, this is Mia Hamm. She's one of the greatest women soccer players ever. But let me tell you what she did. She knew she was great at soccer. When she was 12, she played on a boys' soccer team. 
She went and found the very best soccer player she could. When we have a kid who is strong at programming, why aren't we connecting them online with other kids who are great at programming and making them better? Why aren't we letting them go and spend time with Mike? He would love some interns and let them tell a commute. Why aren't we helping people find their peers? And actually, I spent some time talking to some folks in DC to prepare for, for today, since I'm not a policy person. And they said one of the best things that some states are doing is helping schools find other like schools. So if you have a rural school and you have another rural school with very demographics, and this school is doing well in math, and this school is doing well in reading, facilitating a connection between like schools and helping them learn from each other. Because I'm just going to tell you what happens in rural Georgia. And I love Atlanta. I lived here for many years. But what happens in rural Georgia is we get folks from big cities who come tell us what to do that works in big cities, and it doesn't work in rural Georgia. It, it doesn't. So we need to try to help and facilitate those connections between like-minded schools, between like-minded students. You get artists. Why aren't we connecting artists? Robotics competitions. Look at what's happening with that in the state. Those are just exploding. So many kids are joining in robotics. And it's this same Mia Hamm principle of finding the best and putting them together so that they can become even better. Everybody has opportunities. Now, this is from Louisiana, and they do something really interesting in their state. They reward schools based on what they call strength of diploma. Strength of diploma. So they actually reward schools for having more IB courses, having more AP courses, having stronger courses in that school because one thing that will happen sometimes is your poorer schools, even the gifted kids in the poor schools suffer too. When you have a poor school, you still have gifted kids there that need great things and great experiences. So this is a very interesting one to look at. Tennessee's doing some things also with this. Um, but I also think everybody should have an audience. We tweet from my classroom. We live stream from my classroom. We connect with the world. We were learning about nanotechnology. And we actually Skyped with the guy who wrote Nanotechnology for Dummies from California. OK, I know that sounds crazy, like Nanotechnology for Dummies. But we Skyped with him, and we're connecting, and we're talking, and we're, we're interviewing people. So if we see somebody amazing, we're going to connect. And, and we just don't know boundaries. I mean, honestly, if we're from Georgia, everybody thinks we live in Atlanta anyway, because everybody thinks Atlanta is Georgia. So we don't really bother explaining where we are. But everybody needs an audience. And so much transformation has happened in my classroom We have an audience. There's research about it. I won't bore you with all the education research. But I'm going to just tell you my own story. So I'm a product of Governor's Honors. Um, I was in communicative arts, changed my life. Amazing program. I cannot tell you what that program did for my life. Um, of course, uh, the GAETC conference and then Leadership Georgia. Those were, those were things that really changed my life as well as my time at Georgia Tech. Well, when I was at Governor's Honors, they took us out of the classroom and they took us to a graveyard and we wrote, wrote poetry. And I wrote probably what I consider my best poem I'd ever written. And when I went to Georgia Tech, we had a publication called The Arado and they published it uh, in that first issue. And I got a letter, and I actually found it the other day and took a picture and tweeted it out, from a person who was kind of anonymous. They called themselves Friend of China, and he said, I have the heart of a poet. That moment of having one stranger read something I had written in a piece and responding is probably why I have 153,000 Twitter followers today. Because it showed me that there were people out there that I could help or encourage or connect with or be part of their life too. So we don't just live life in our tiny towns, our tiny communities. We live a bigger life now. We have the opportunity to make the world a better place. And I really did not plan on being the cool cat teacher and being followed. I started blogging coming back from the GAETC conference because I knew I needed to teach my students. My students named me the cool cat teacher. We're the Westwood Wildcats. And so they're like, you're cool. We're the Wildcats, so you be the cool cat teacher. Casey, that I showed you the picture of, actually helped me name a blog. And, and then all of a sudden, people started 
following me. And I'm like, what is going on? And they were reading my stuff. And within a year, I was nominated for best teaching blog in the world. And I'd won the online learning award and was in Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. And I'm like, what? Like, the world changed. Everything changed. And now our audience is not some letter that somebody puts in your P.O. box in college. It's when somebody messages back. My son was at a thing in D.C. and met the chaplain of the Senate, who's an amazing person. And I tweeted him about my son's experience. He tweeted me back, and we connected and had a little bitty conversation. It's just amazing what audience does. And it changed my life, and it changes the life of student, students. So now we want to shift, though, to teachers. Okay, so I've talked about my wish for classrooms. Um, teachers, there's all this stuff out here I've mentioned, right? The formative assessment and the makerspace and all that. Well, teachers are asked to do it, but they're just supposed to go home and just learn it whenever you get a chance. Just, just go home and figure it out, right? That's what most teachers are asked to do. And th with the ESSA Act, teachers are actually able to personalize their learning. It's, they're kind of shocked. They're in shock a little bit, though, because nobody's ever asked them what they want to learn. So we're having a little bit of an adjustment period. I'm getting emails from every, people all over, not just in Georgia, going, how am I going to write this personal plan? Nobody's ever asked me what I wanted to learn before and what I need to improve. And I always tell them, formative assessments start there if you don't understand it. But I know teachers that their school's got Chromebooks. And they're literally opening up the Chromebooks and the training was going to be in another six months. And that just makes no sense to me. So somehow, and I was talking to some of the folks in D.C., somehow we've got to partner money we spend on training and money we spend on technology to try to make sure that gets spent at the same time, if at all possible. Because otherwise, um, techno you, you buy technology and you don't train the teachers, you're really wasting your money. I hate to tell you that because I like technology, but you're just wasting your money. Um, here's the thing. Teachers are smart. Most of your teachers 55 or older, how many of you remember these? You're going to show your age if you remember this. Anybody remember the blue ink? The smell of power. You know, I can pass this test. Okay, so this is a mimeograph machine for those of you who are younger and you have no idea what I'm talking about. And it was done with a chemical reaction. And, and you basically could get high smelling the paper, okay? It's just how it was. So these teachers had to mix all these formulas and stuff to be able to do mimeograph machines. That's your teachers 55 and older did this stuff. They're smart. If they can operate a mimeograph, they can operate this. They, they can. But you can't just expect them to figure it out. They used to have, I've asked them, they had training on the mimeograph machine because if you didn't mix it just right, I don't know what would happen, but I don't think it would be very good. So we train them on mimeographs and we're not training them how, you know, okay, everybody can have their phone now in the state of Georgia. Mike, that was your legislation. Can have their phone, but I'll tell you this, I have some friends in a school up the road that I won't name. I was telling her about formative assessment and she says, nope, they, they make us, uh, they can't have their phones on campus. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, they can do so much with these. No, nope, we don't let them have it. It's just too much trouble. And it's like, it's because they don't have anything constructive to do with them because the teachers haven't been taught how to use them. Um, and then just innovate. Um, this is a girl on the left. I am so excited about the Amazon Echo in the classroom. Amazon Alexa. Little kids, you know, what's one plus two? And they're checking their math facts. How do you spell? Get one at home. If you're tired of doing homework, you know, how do you spell um, committee? And it'll spell it for you, right? And it does. And so there are people all over the country. Teachers are buying these themselves because they are so helpful. It's like having a virtual assistant. And then I can take my kids anywhere in the world with Google Cardboard and their cell phone. These are all parts of innovation that we should have. So great teachers, I believe, have no script. I believe they're empowered, they're passionate, they're interested, they're knowledgeable, they're able to bring their interest to the classroom. But please don't think it's age. So this is Miss Atkins. This is Miss Grace Atkins. She is a full-time uh, learning lab director at my school, and she turns 90 in May. She was my fourth grade teacher, she corrects me. She rides 120 miles a week on her stationary bike. She reads three books a week. So if you've got an excuse about not exercising, Miss Atkins, she can just put all of us to shame. This woman is amazing. And she's almost 90. And sometimes I wonder what we've done to ourselves because we're so e eager to push some amazing people out the door. 
um, because once you got the teaching bug, you got it for life. Um, I do think that there's things we can do to help more teachers stay in teaching. Sometimes I think teachers need a sabbatical. I know teachers who retire and after a year they're ready to go back in the classroom, but they retire. So where are they, what are they going to do with the rest of their lives? They love kids. They're amazing teachers. They were almost about to burn out after 30 years of this stuff. And why can't we do sabbaticals? The other thing I'm thrilled about, and I don't know if we can ever make it happen because there's, we got unions and you got principal and you got all this, but this whole idea of teacher leaders, I'm going to jump ahead. How many of you have heard of teaching hospitals? Like we've all heard of those, where you have doctors who doctor and also teach, okay? There's this thing called research schools that's a little tiny budding movement that's starting to spread. It really started in Silicon Valley. And what's happening is sometimes the principal might teach a class, and sometimes the curriculum director might teach a class or two, and sometimes the IT director might teach a class or two. Because here's what's happening. Education is moving so fast that people who leave the classroom become irrelevant like that, just like that. It's so fast. It's like medicine. It's just so fast that, that you can become irrelevant. We've got to find a way for everybody to be able to teach and then also be able to help other teachers. And I don't know if the powers that be are going to allow this, but I'll tell you this. I know some great schools, a lot of them are charter schools, some of them are private schools who are doing this now, and it's fantastic. Um, so we need teacher leaders, but I, I, you are seeing the term residency and clinicals coming up. So some states, Tennessee is doing this where they have residencies and you may go teach in an inner city school for a couple years and then that's your residency as a teacher and then you can choose to go teach where you want to. So these terms are starting to happen and these are things that you could do, we could do here in the state of Georgia. But now here's what we're dealing with, okay, how many of you saw Jurassic Park? I really thought teaching would be just this nice little happy place, but I don't care where you teach. If you're talking to a teacher, it's a struggle. It's hard, um, and you deal with a lot of it because a lot of you are politicians and policymakers. Now, I worked for a very short period of time. I was an intern through the Carl Benson Institute of Government for Sam Nunn many years ago when I was in college, and intern means you get to answer the phone calls with the crazy people. Okay, so if they thought that Senator Nunn was going to pass a law that laser beams were going to put out everybody's eyes in the United States, then I had to talk to the person. Um, and, but I'll tell you this, and, and I work with amazing parents, I work with amazing kids, but I, I think that the whatever that causes crazy people is kind of on the increase. <laughs> because, I mean, I get it because I do social media. So I get trolls and I get stalkers and I get all that kind of mess when you have a lot of followers. But I, the sad thing is I'm seeing this in education. This is why some teachers are leaving. Kindness never goes out of style. Respect. If you've got a problem with a person, my dad, James Lee Adams, always taught me, go talk to the person face to face. Just go talk to them. And you, as politicians and policymakers, my hope for you is that you will model for all of us how we should act, because there are just so, so few people these days who seem to be modeling it. So now we're here to the end of this, and I think I have, what, four minutes left? How, many, how much time do I have left? A few minutes? So a guy named Michael Simmons told a great story um, in Albany. Um, he's a, a head of the oldest African-American church in Albany. And imagine yourself going into your neighborhood and the police line is across, and you see smoke. And you're looking and you're thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on? And you get out of your car, and all you can think of is that it's my house. Is my house the one burning because there's something going on? And you fight your way through, and you run, and you are trying to get to your house because everything you love and everything you care about and everything that matters to you is in that house. And those things are not pictures on walls or, any, or photo albums, those things are people. And you are trying to get to your house, and then you get to your house, and you almost feel guilty because you look, and it's your neighbor's house, and your neighbor's house is on fire. So you take a deep breath, and you say, it's not my house. Okay, we can't have that kind of thinking anymore because this is our house, and this is our state, and this is our children, and this is our future. And I'm just tired of excuses. Kip and I were talking, and the cars were coming up, and it's like, how long? Do we have these conversations about education? Can you ever remember a time when we weren't having a conversation about education and making it better? Can anybody remember a time? Do people ever get tired of it? 
How, what works? What's going to make things better? And the answer really goes back to um, NASA in the 1960s. There was a politician who walked up to a guy who was a janitor, and he was sweeping up under the lockers. He said, what, what are you doing, sir? Because he made eye contact, and he kind of felt like he had to talk to him. And he said, I'm putting a man on the moon. And the politician was struck because from the top of that organization to the bottom of that organization, they had a unifying vision that they were going to put a man on the moon. Now, standards are okay, but we have too many of them. But I have one standard. This is my only thing. When I went to my school, I said, I'm building a world-class technology program. And the kids laughed at me. Some of the teachers laughed at me. But the greatest software ever invented is not technology, it's this. There is nothing that can overcome the human brain and the human will when we decide we're going to do something. And I'll tell you this, Georgia has a lot of resources, but we have some of the most stubborn people on the planet in this state. I'm just going to tell you. We have got some stubborn people that when they set their mind to something. So why can't we have a common vision as a state that every child, we can't be self-serving anymore and say, oh, my children's education is going to be okay. It's our children. It's our house. Our neighbor's house is our house. We have to think about what is our common vision. Um, I'm going to skip a few things here uh, because I teach bell to bell. But I will tell you this, one of the most important things to realize is that our expectations are everything. Do you know the number one indicator of success in a classroom is what the teacher believes about whether their, child, their children can learn and whether the, the teacher is able to teach them? The expectations. But our children have expectations too. 90% uh, of people who end up in prison were told by one or both parents that you'll end up in prison. So what we say to people is very important, and I know that people have to get elected, but I'll tell you this, you have teachers that are spending all their money buying Google Cardboard, buying their maker spaces, buying all this stuff, and when they hear people talk about how sorry all the teachers are, it makes me angry. It makes teachers angry. Teachers are given everything they have to a society that doesn't appreciate them very much at all. And it's really eager to bash them, and they can't. And teachers, we can't tell our side of the story, ever, because it has to remain private. So, all of you had that teacher, and I want you to think back of who was that teacher. Have you thanked that teacher? Have you thanked that teacher publicly? Have you gone to visit that teacher? Have you called that teacher? And I promise you, that teacher had an expectation of you and said, "I want you, Kelly, to be different. I want you to be more." I want you to reach your best. I want you to be amazing. And that expectation got you there. So the question is, what do you actually expect out of schools in the state of Georgia? Have you just thrown up your hands and you're like, whatever, mom's not my child? Or are you saying, you know what, every child deserves a great education because if we can invest and if we can get this mindset and get out of the trap of the past, and move to the future, we can actually do something in this state that is special and different. Because I'll tell you this, as much time as I spend in DC trying on the phone with them, trying to find lots of exciting and innovative things, I don't know how much exciting and new and innovative I really heard. Because we're in a new day with new neuroscience, with new brains, new children, we've got to think differently. So I'll just encourage you with this. Do teachers have a seat at the table when you're making policy? Are you giving teachers, teachers, classroom teachers, a seat at the table when you're talking about classrooms because they are some of the most qualified to help you make decisions you need to make for the state? Thanks. That's awesome. Thanks, Vicki. It reminds me, um, a few years ago, I toured with Governor Deal's entourage down in Louisiana to talk about the turnaround schools down there. And there was one school that was 100% free and reduced lunch, 100% English speaker second language that was a failing school. And I talked to the principal come in to turn around. I said, what did you do? So it was very simple. I went through my staff and I asked them a single question. What do you think these kids can do? Do you think these kids can learn? And half the staff was like, no, these kids are hopeless. They can't speak English. They're poor. Their parents don't support them, et cetera, et cetera. So these kids can't learn. And the other parents and the other group of teachers said, 
you know what, we can give it a shot. I bet these kids can learn. She kept the ones who thought the kids could learn. She got new people, and that went from an F school to a B school in two and a half years. So expectations, I think Vicki is a huge thing. So our next panelist is uh, very uh, apropos for me right now in my time of my life. I have three, all three of my boys are in college right now. And so the cost of higher education is a very sensitive subject in my house at this sort of time. Luckily, two of the three have kept the Hope Scholarship. The third one is a great kid, uh, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, and so when Kelly said we were also going to be talking about higher ed and the exploding costs and the relevance, I'm like, that's very timely. I know in my time in legislature, that subject came up over and over again. We had a bill at one point about um, capping tuition costs and a lot of battles between the legislature and the Board of Regents over costs. I've had a lot of discussions with college presidents around is the cost model sustainable? And even more, um, is what we're teaching in higher ed relevant? Are we giving these kids any kind of value for the money and the tremendous amount of money we're building in? So our next speaker, Gordon Rogers and his company, Edivate, is working in that space to try to figure out what's going on with higher ed, what's going on with the costs, and what is going on with how effective we're delivering that education. So our next panelist, Gordon Rogers. Thank you, Gordon. Mic check. Is this on? All right. I'm really glad we are uh, live streaming on Facebook today because that means uh, Mark Zuckerberg is definitely watching and uh, he'll hear my plea, my personal plea for my own Oculus uh, uh, little tool that he just introduced. So uh, all of those of you uh, interested in virtual reality, uh, go get your Oculus because uh, he just announced that as part of their new offering. Um, Mike, I can certainly uh, feel for, uh, your pain about cost of higher education. Um, I've had uh, six of my children go through college here in, in Georgia. Um, actually, no, one went to Florida State. The others all went through um, either Georgia or uh, Georgia Tech, and thankfully, they all went on uh, Hope Scholarships. So uh, <clears throat> the, well, the one that got away to Florida State, I call him my hopeless kid, um, but he did graduate. So. Uh, managed to find a job. Anyway, I'm here to talk about uh, a problem that is kind of the flip side of a lot of focus that is going on in higher education. Um, there's a lot of focus on uh, the graduation rate, and which is gradually going up, but it's not going up quickly enough. And so what I'm looking at is a path forward for people with debt due to student loans, but who have not finished their degree. A few months ago, Bill Gates was in town, and he actually visited Georgia State University to highlight the success they are having in increasing graduation rates, particularly among minorities and Pell Grant students. Um, they have implemented a number of systems that have really increased the graduation rate, and they are doing great things. Um, but he pointed out something that the U.S. is number one in, which is the highest dropout rate in the, uh, in the world. Uh, we have number, we're number one in terms of students starting college, but we're number 20 in, those, in terms of those who finish. So that's not a great statistic. And the numbers, uh, despite the fact that everybody is aiming for 100% graduation, that's of course the goal. The reality in the United States is barely half of people who uh, start college actually graduate with a, a degree in six years. So we have a long way to go before we're at 100%. So a lot of people end up wearing this kind of t-shirt, which has a certain stigma. And the problem is, in our society, we have kind of a binary view of college. You're either a college graduate or you're not. And so if you're not, you're considered a dropout. And you carry that stigma for a long time. And sadly, that holds, um, puts a lot of things against you in the job market. We have half a million people students every year dropping out of colleges in the U.S. And that's, that's a big number. It's too big. Um, by comparison, the U.S. Uh, uh, student loan program um, puts out over $100 billion a year in student loans. By comparison, the entire U.S. interstate system was built for about $100 billion uh, half a century ago. And so imagine if it only completed, uh, was only halfway across the country. I think people would say there's something wrong. And yet, we seem to be satisfied with a barely half a graduation rate uh, for that kind of money. We probably all know young people who have gone to college for one or two years and end up doing this. 
And part of that is because so many uh, students, uh, high school students, they're really not given any other choice. They're not made aware of any choice. They just feel, oh, you've got to go to college, you've got to get a degree, or you're not going to succeed in this world. So they go into college, they discover they're really not college material, they're not ready for it. And so, sadly, they drop out, but they've probably taken out student loans in the meantime. So they end up bagging groceries or working in a place like this. And on average, they're carrying over $12,000 of debt. The average college graduate today has over $30,000 of debt, but if you've only had a year or two of college, you've already incurred about a third of that. So there's really no off-ramp for a dropout. Um, there's a lot of programs for students to get uh, jobs and internships, but of course they have to be enrolled. If you're no longer a customer, a paying student, uh, the registrar pays no attention to you, the career placement office pays no, pays no attention to you. So you're kind of on a dead-end road, which uh, leads to one dead-end job after another. And often the road takes you to a place like this. This is where some of these folks sadly end up. They're desperate for cash and they have to do something and they end up getting deeper and deeper in debt. And uh, one statistic that a lot of people may not know is college dropouts account for two-thirds of all student loan defaults. And that's over eight million. That's a six billion dollar problem um, growing by six or seven percent a year. So this problem isn't going away, it's getting bigger. Now on the flip side, many of you in Georgia are aware of the Governor's High Demand Career Initiative that came out just a couple of years ago. We have a severe talent shortage. And a lot of that talent can be filled by these uh, young folks that actually have quite a few qualifications. Uh, the Georgetown Center, University Center for Education and Workforce recently published a report, which I encourage you to read, uh, called Good Jobs That Pay Without an MBA, Without a BA. And there are many different types of jobs that you can um, sign up for and, and be qualified for with a, just a year or two of college. And so even if you go on uh, the job search site called Indeed, and search for jobs that do not require a bachelor's degree in the state of Georgia that pay $45,000 or more, you'll find 24,000 listed. So these folks, they can do better than bagging groceries and working at McDonald's. Now many of you may know uh, that I've been involved with um, Brian Trikinchana for a number of years and his company, Work Ready Grad, which was to help students in college be prepared, better prepared for um, career, a career after college. And so this is kind of an offshoot uh, program of that, which cynically we might call work ready drop it. Because these folks have a year or two of college, they've proven that they have some competencies and capabilities, and they just need that kind of last, last mile of training to get uh, be qualified for an actual position. And so we're working on something we call a bridge boot camp which is to fill, plug that hole between academia and industry with the skills that people need. And these are not requiring uh, another two or three years of education. Uh, little known fact, half of uh, HR managers are reporting severe problems in filling middle skills jobs, those requiring some college but not a full four-year degree. So there's a, a large talent pool that exists here. So what we're looking at is doing a 10-week uh, program similar to a uh, coding boot camp, uh, 400 hours of uh, blended learning. Uh, but instead of teaching coding, it's teaching other skills, which on the left-hand side, you'll see bars in yellow. Those are representative of all the different uh, baseline skills. These are not technical skills, but they're baseline foundational skills, communication, problem solving, basic math. Those skills make up anywhere between a quarter and a half of all these job descriptions of this uh, survey of 25 million job postings that was done last year by Burning Glass. So these folks can be qualified to get those skills. So some of the skills that would be taught in this program are communication and business writing, which is the number one skill all the um, HR and hiring managers are looking for and still can't find properly, and others, management, project management, and um, uh, what is that? Critical thinking and uh, data analytics. 
And another part of this would involve a hands-on um, on-site business challenge held at a company so that students in this program get to work on-site and the hiring and talent managers of that organization can see how these folks operate in, um, in real time and how they interact with each other. It's much better than a job interview or just looking on a resume. They can detect qualities that don't show up on paper. So these would hopefully, after the 10 weeks, put uh, these folks in a position to qualify for internships and apprenticeships and co-op opportunities with these companies that have this severe talent shortage. So this would be a private sector solution to a problem. Uh, the uh, support would come from various partners, including um, the large student loan uh, service providers, the different companies, because as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, they have a very high default rate and, a man, and once somebody defaults on a student loan, they're unlikely to qualify for a car loan, a mortgage, or any other type of uh, financial involvement. So there would be an incentive for these folks to uh, offer a reduced interest rate uh, to the students that complete the program because they're much more likely to go on and, and uh, become gainfully employed. And the other uh, partnerships would come from the talent uh, recruiters and uh, staffing and placement agencies that would have a, a rich source of qualified talent uh, to fill that uh, talent gap that they are currently uh, seeking to fill. And they, they would also be seen as uh, underwriters of this program. So essentially, it's called the Bridge Bootcamp. You can learn more on this um, uh, website, uh, thebridgebootcamp.com. I welcome any questions and uh, feedback. Thank you. And one thing you'll notice about that I think is in common between um, Vicki and Gordon is what I would call a flexible, different approach to education. If you think about the traditional K-12 education models developed at the turn of the 20th century, and there's some books talk about it in a factory assembly line. We've got a first grade, second grade, we put them in a class, we do the check the box, and we have a list of things, and we just kind of move them on through. And to be honest, the academia in colleges is, is basically a model that was designed to educate the elite 5% of, of people to give them a classical education. And now we're trying to, and trying to turn it into a job program. And, and basically, as anything else, a very large institutions are difficult to move with modern time. Then you couple that with the fact that technology and life moves at a much faster pace, having a hard time keeping our model up to date with what we're actually delivering. So we're not going to open up the questions. I have a couple of questions first. I'll get started, and then we'll bring up the lights and get to the audience. So um, um, for Vicki, you and I talked a little bit beforehand, but the, the buzzword today in education, the only thing you really hear about now is standards, 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 standards. And we have, we're not going to talk about Common Core here, I promise, but we have the movement in the past 20 years to get very detailed and find prescription to standards that, the standards for one grade in the state of Georgia are probably 25, 30 pages um, of detail. And, and the goal of that, I think, was to make sure that the kids are learning the right things. And in the poor schools, everybody knew that, yeah, the kids are just getting babysat and they're really not learning anything. I think the goal of the standards was to make sure that something could actually happen there and these kids were learning what they were supposed to. But I know that you and I, you have a different opinion, and so do I, that we may have gone overkill. You comment a little about standards of where you think the standard level should be and then how that would factor into to policyholders being able to say, okay, I actually believe that that school is teaching my kids what they're supposed to do. Well, I had a um, researcher who uh, talks about this on my uh, podcast not too long ago, and he said basically that a teacher can really comprehend and go towards about seven meta standards at a time. Like cognitively as a teacher, you just can't get your arms around 180 standards. Um, I will know teachers that, are, that spend all of their time aligning standards and not writing lesson plans. And you wonder who the audience is. Um, a lot of teachers spend so much time doing paperwork and it, it's just kind of over the top. I mean, I think that we should really condense down and say, okay, what's really important? Uh, my son's taking a, a virtual school class right now, and he had to memorize the dates that the FBLA was founded, 10 dates. And I, I teach the same stuff, but I, I, that's not, I don't teach any of that. And I'm sitting here thinking, 
Well, who wrote that into the standards? Like, I guess the FBLA people did, but was that really important for a business and technology class to memorize 10 of the most important dates in the history of FBLA? And it just feels like standards overkill. So I think that, um, you know, if you, if you try to do everything, you accomplish nothing. And Deming uh, said that, you know, whatever gets measured gets done. And in fact, that's the only thing that gets done. But, you know, Kip is an engineer and he says if he wants to improve anything, he just charts it and puts it on a wall. Okay, but if you had a wall with a, a progress on 124 or 184 standards, what do you look at? Like, what can you understand about that? So I really think that we've got to have some common sense and get down to say, okay, what's the most important? Can every child read? Um, and, and are they pursuing things that they also love? Are there, you know, the strengths? Are they inventing? Are they creating? And e-portfolios and having portfolios are a great thing. The, the struggle with, with portfolios is that it's notoriously horrible that if I have a portfolio at my school and you have a portfolio at your, your school, we assess it so different that you can't use portfolios to really benchmark schools against each other. But you could have the existence of a portfolio as part of the measure. And with the ESSA Act, you've actually got a lot of flexibility to define what you think that success is and what it means in the state. So um, we really, I hope, can be creative. But the, right now, we're just, we've got standards paralysis. And uh, fortunately, I write, I'm in a small private school. I write my own curriculum. I have my standards, but there are times where the opportunity to program apps came along. I said, you know what? Standards are going out the window. We're programming apps for six weeks. And I will tell you that when I went back and looked, we met all those standards and more. Um, but there are times when you want to, as a teacherpreneur, take advantage of opportunities, and a lot of teachers cannot do it. About half the schools that sign up to collaborate on the projects where we build apps together, about half of the public schools from the state of Georgia have to drop out because they can't stay in. And that's a shame. There are a lot of public schools we do collaborate with in the projects, but they just, you know, I, I have to test. I have to meet these standards. I can't do, I can't build apps because I have to teach some dates or something. And I'm thinking, it's a computer science class. I mean, come on, program. <laughs> so um, anyway, but I, I guess the practical farmer's daughter just thinks that we, you know, dad always just said, you know, what's my yield? <laughs> and I guess it's harder to figure that out when you're dealing with, um, with education. But I, I do think that we've got to be careful to keep adding more standards on you know, what are we going to accomplish? I wish we could just have one vision statement that this is what we want every child in the state of Georgia to have, no matter where you are, and have a dream and go towards it. Awesome. So, Gordon, I um, um, talked a little bit about the technical college system because it's kind of relative to the same type of thing you're talking about. I had a young man who was an Eagle Scout in my, my boys' Boy Scout troop, um, who, cerebral palsy kid, a little different, smart kid, but he, his mom was looking for something different for him, and he went to technical college, and in two years, he got a very high-paying job. But in talking to the mom, she was having the same thing as in my area, in affluent suburbs, John Creek, South Forsyth. It's the stigma, right? Oh, you're not going to college. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? What's wrong? You know, and, and, and unfortunately, that's out there. Have you, is there any progress being made there? Are some of the things you're doing there, is there anything we can do as policymakers to try to to get rid of the, the sort of stigma that everybody has to go to college, or have you seen any best practices there? Um, yeah, it really takes, I think, some success examples. I mean, TCSG is probably one of the best yes. uh, systems for uh, technical colleges in the country, uh, but they have an image problem. And, and again, that, I, that goes back to high school guidance counselors, most of whom are programmed, get these kids into a college. And, oh, well, if they can't achieve them, maybe we can talk about uh, technical. And we've got to remove that stigma and show, by example, people who have good paying jobs and exciting jobs in areas that didn't require a four-year degree. But they're, high school kids today are not getting that exposure, with few exceptions. Maybe in Camilla they are because there's uh, more, more opportunity in, the, in that area for the technical college job. But until that stigma is overcome, people are only going to look at a uh, technical school as a last resort and typically and this is why the, the um, profile of their, their typical student is 28, 29 years That's old right. and they've worked 
usually kicked around for the last five or six years in odd jobs. Mm -hmm. And they finally wake up and realize, okay, I gotta do something better than bagging groceries. I got a family. I'm gonna get myself some skills. Oh, here's, here's a mostly free opportunity to get education mm -hmm. and get a real job. There you go. Awesome. Um, I do believe that Georgia really has done a good job with technical college system and you know they advertise heavily during the Georgia high school football playoffs and things like that and I know that they're trying to rebrand their image a little bit and again you know the, the irony of your problem is saying all these kids 50% of them go to college and drop out and have debt and no real job and then a, a shortage of people who can get a two-year technical college degree and make forty five fifty sixty thousand dollars a year the irony there is is pretty is something else. Okay, this time um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I see at least one back here and I see two coming. So um, we'll take some questions. Um, I'd like to moment uh, try to tie together the, the previous two panels with this one. Uh, one of the things that was discussed uh, is the idea of the need to improve health and health outcomes and reduce health disparities in Georgia. Uh, Georgia being literally in the lowest quintile of all the, all the states across the country in terms of health outcomes. Uh, one way to improve population health, it has been asserted uh, by some folks that I know in the field, is to improve education. That, that in fact the education link and improving health outcomes is a very strong vital one. What I'd like to know is if you guys agree with this, this proposition, uh, if you could speak to it, and if you do, how might we go about the business of uh, strengthening the link between investment in education and investment in health? You want to start? Just so I understand the question, it's the investment in health uh, at an earlier stage so that people can concentrate on education because in many cases people drop out of school for um, health reasons. Is that part of part of the issue? It's more like that the more educated people are, the healthier they are. The healthier they are. Yeah. The, the greater the chance they have of we have That's of right. reducing health disparities. The strong there's a strong correlation between education level and health general health levels. Right. The question is which causes which? <laughs> That's um, a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a concern, and there's a strong link. Um, you will find that uh, uh, the worse educated someone has, they're probably going to have more health problems. So, again, good health care is essential to people completing, completing their education. I know the subject came up when um, I was the first year out of legislature in the, the, the school turnaround bill last year of you know, if, you're, if schools are failing, how much of it is on the teachers and the school, how much of it is on the surrounding environment? In other words, is it because the kids are healthy or are unhealthy um, or not properly fed and, and things like that? So it does, I think it all interacts and I think it also goes back to mental health as well because if you go, if I'm, if I'm less educated in one of Gordon's dropouts who has a low end, dead end job, that leads to depressive and mental, mental um, challenges, which leads to behaviors that are going to make you less healthy. So I don't know if Vicki. So you know, let's, you know. let's go back to this whole idea that we talked about earlier of if so, if there are schools, like you mentioned, one in Louisiana, in a very poor area who are achieving incredible results, it means it can be done. That's right. The problem is everybody, as Mike said earlier, has their opinion about how to improve education. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily hold water. So I really think this whole concept of, okay, we've got, a, we've got struggling schools here in a very poor area. Where are, what are the other schools that have turned it around and are in that, a similar situation? And what are they doing? And set up, um, you know how you have sister cities where you learn from each other and they're very similar. You could really almost have that same approach with schools. Uh, there are, we call them best practices. There are best practices in schools that are doing it. They're all over the place that are doing it. So how are they doing it and can we pair up those relationships? Because here's the thing, when we, 
uh, I was talking to somebody in DC and they said we have uh, NCLB PTSD in this country. So we've gone from like too much accountability to no accountability, you know, in some ways. And we need, we need to have accountability. But I just think that what we can do to facilitate those connections, because honestly, if you have a principal at a struggling school, there's some things that he will talk or he or she will talk to a principal who has turned it around about on a private connection that they would never air in public. So building those connections and those relationships, I think, is a key part of improving, um, improving education. And we can do it within the state, or you can even do it outside of the state. I mean, um, but if somebody's doing it, it means it can be done. And it can be done. But I just, I just don't think that people who are too removed from the situation are going to be the ones to solve it. I think that you have to empower the people on the ground. And if the people on the ground don't have the resources and the accountability and the authority to do it, then you have to um, help them get that accountability and that authority to be able to do it. And it's not an easy answer because here's the thing. It requires work. You can't buy a great education. It would be nice, but I know people who spend a whole lot of money and send their kids to a great school and they don't have a very good education. And then I know people who send kids to schools that do have, and, and a lot of it comes back up to this software right here and this right here where we decide we're going to, people in a community decide they're going to have an excellent education. And I wish it was easy, but it's hard work. And, um, but I do think pairing up schools to share best practices is a key thing we need to start doing. I, I agree. It's interesting you brought that up. I will say real quickly that um, whether you agree or disagree with his policy, the Governor Deal's vision of why it was so important to make sure that all the kids in Georgia were getting education, especially those in failing schools, was it does link up to taxes and health. Education, you get a stronger education, you get a better job, you can better tax revenues to the state, you don't become a ward of the state. Um, your health is better, which means you're not on Medicaid or things that are going to drain the state's budget. It all, there's a link between all of that, and we know that if we do a bad job of educating our kids, that we're just setting ourselves up for other problems later. Okay, next question, Brian. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brian Sikanshina. I'm an ed tech entrepreneur here in Atlanta, and I have a few questions for Vicki. I very much enjoyed your presentation. If I may, I'm going to ask that these questions are related, so I'm going to ask them together, and then um, I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, when I was a, a freshman at uh, Georgia Tech in 2004, uh, problem-based learning was a relatively new thing for teachers to embrace, though fortunately, especially now that I have two little uh, girls myself in elementary school, I'm seeing examples of problem-based learning, uh, experiential learning popping up um, all, ar all around. But I'm curious to know, what is the current state of our state in terms of problem-based learning and experiential learning becoming the norm? Uh, how are we doing? And what can be done to accelerate our traction in that direction? The second question is, your first slide was talking about creativity and how much it's gone down. And I think about how in a lot of the other countries, a lot of uh, Asian countries, they've got higher math scores, science scores. But we've got Google and Facebook, and we've got innovation. We've got creativity. Uh, almost a little bit related to the first question, what are the top three things that are being done or could be done to increase the creativity um, of, our, of our children and to keep our country innovative? And then the third question, you, know, you, you talked about um, Kennedy's charge, that you know, we want to go to the moon, and that, you, that vision, that common... Uh, that vision brought our country together to excel. But you didn't give us any suggestions on what is your common vision or what could be a common vision we could embrace. Yeah. So do you currently have one? Uh, if not, what may that be? So th those are my three questions. Thank you. Well, I'll answer your last one first. I mean, my common vision would be we would be the best in the world. The question is how you define the best in the world. And for me, can we have people who create and invent? Here's the thing. Compliance does not mean a good education. You can have a child who complies all the way through, checks off every single thing, and they sit there when, on the day of graduation and they wonder, well, why am I here? And what's my purpose? And do I even know what I'm good at doing? And did anybody actually customize my education to my strengths? So it would be that every single child in the state of Georgia graduates understanding that they know that they matter, they're important, they have a work to do in the world. They know their strengths. 
and those strengths have been invested in, and they haven't just been beat up on what they're not good at doing. If you are stink at math, trust me, you know you stink at math. You don't need everybody to tell you how many times you stink at math and take you out of the art class, which is the only reason you want to go to school, and give you three extra hours of math. So I think that children are, they are our future, but every child, so my personal purpose as a teacher is I tell those kids that I want to find something you do better than anybody else in this room. And, and I will notice things, and I'll say, you know what, you're a great filmmaker, and they go on to be filmmakers. You're an amazing artist, they go on to be artists. But when we are too busy pushing them through the factory, trying to put another widget and check another box, when do we have time for project-based learning? I'm doing some work for a company right now with project-based learning. The problem with project-based learning is teachers say they don't have time for problem-based learning and inquiry-based inquiry learning because they have too much, they have to check off the boxes with their standards and they have to be on the same page with the others. So I really think we have to reinvent and as, as he was talking about this whole personalizing learning, competency-based learning, there are classes where some kids are going faster than others, so say they're very good at, at chemistry. Why couldn't they be at grade 12 in chemistry and grade eight or grade nine in reading? Why do they have to be in this same track that we invented all these years ago? So, you know, if, if I had a wish, because I, I have to, I'm way too empathetic and I love every child. They were given flu shots at the school yesterday and I cried with every one of them that I saw get a shot. <laughs> but it's that every child is important. Every child matters. And are we, there are things we can do with technology to personalize learning. Right. There are things, why can't every child in the state to actually take a test? And I mean, that test costs like $15 a kid where they know that what they're good at doing but they're, they're shooting in the dark, trying to guess. I think that's part of our dropout rate problem. They don't know what they're good at doing. Oh, daddy went here, I'm gonna go there. Mama did that, so I might do that. Or I met a doctor once, so I wanna <laughs> be a doctor, right? They don't have any facts, and I'm able to look at kids and say, here's your strengths, here's your weaknesses. This job is gonna be really a good fit for you, but if you go into this medical field right here, you have to memorize a lot of facts, and you're gonna have to really to work hard to memorize the vocabulary that's required to be a nurse. Are you willing to do that? And they'll say yes or no. But see, they're going in with their eyes wide open when they get a strengths approach, when they know what they're learning. So I kind of think those are tied together. Um, but you know what? Here's the thing. Um, we need visionaries. We need leadership. Um, we need great leaders. We need people who are going to have morals and ethics and do the right thing even when people aren't looking. One thing I learned in D.C. is that sometimes Senator Nunn would do the totally right thing and he would catch all kinds of grief for it because it looked wrong. We've got to care about doing right more than we do about looking right because in the end I do believe it's going to shake out and it's going to come back around. Um, and people have got, we've got to be servant leaders and not just self-serving. So you can call me an idealist, but I'll tell you this. I went to a little tiny school. I still have no budget. My budget's $12,500 a year, okay? And I've built a world class. It, it comes back to saying this is what we're going to do. And I love our state, and it breaks my heart. There's no excuse for us to have children who, who graduate with, without a purpose. I, I wouldn't just give them a diploma. I would make sure they had a purpose in their hand and in their heart and knew what they were good at doing. And, and I think that personalizing, they customize their playlist. They customize their friends list. Why can't we customize the education? It's because most of us who are in charge, we were educated a different way. And we can't get out of the box to realize we have the capability. If we could unleash the technical talent in the state of Georgia, we could really do some amazing things. And you put me on my soapbox, that's a hot button for me. But um, I just think every child matters. And when a child, when it, I don't care what you teach them. If a child thinks they're unimportant, if a child thinks they don't matter in the world, they, we fail. Because they do, they're, they're very important. This relates a little bit of a soapbox I'll get on for about 60 seconds, which is what I call autopsy testing, which is the end of the year milestones, CRCT, and of course testing, which have some value because they do apply some accountability, and, and I'm not trying to get out of accountability, but with technology now, 
we can embed those and make them competency-based and be formative-based so that they happen gradually throughout the school year and are not disruptive things and the teachers get the information before it's too late and for the year. And to the point, if Johnny is really good in chemistry, he might take that test in February instead of having to wait to every other single kid for the factory model to crank that out. So I think it's an area where I think we have a lot of room for improvement. And, and Brian, you mentioned creativity. It's something interesting. My company sells two video games to China, and I go to China several um, <coughs> a couple times a year, and there's, a, there's tons and tons of very capable, very smart, technical Chinese people we work with. But the majority of their video games that they get are from the West. Why? Creativity. Because their, their education system for, and their culture it doesn't value creativity as much as the United States. And what I'm afraid of is that, is that we, we're not careful with education trends. We could be kind of pushing the creativity out of what we're doing, and then, and then we've lost what is a big advantage that we have in this country right now. All right, any other questions? Uh, Valencia. This will be the last question, looks like, from our time. I appreciate the presentation. One of the questions I have when you talk about innovation and creativity and allowing teachers uh, to really teach, uh, one of the challenges is how do we uh, get that message to our superintendents mm -hmm. who are making these decisions? And a lot of times on the state, we get blamed for a lot. Uh, but some of the things, like you were saying, being able to be creative in the classrooms, how do we push that message down to the um, superintendents? You get it all the way down the chain um, to in the classrooms so that the teachers are not, I had one example, so a teacher told me they're having to do eight lesson plans per subject and it's due by Thursday. And so I was asking, well, how in the world are you able to execute the lesson plans if you're spending all the time trying to put the lesson plans together? When do you actually the teach plans. the kids in the classroom? Yeah. And then do you have time to even reteach the, the stuff that they end up missing? So that was one of the questions is, you know, where does that start and stop at as far as being able to say this needs to stop here and this is how we need to change so that the teachers can teach in the classrooms? So that you have the opportunity with the ESSA Act to, to define what is, um, what, how are we going to measure success? You have the opportunity to put other measures in there besides test scores. I cannot tell you how important that is. Do I have all the answers for you? I've really tried to give you a menu today. There are some best practices out there for states that are trying it, but all the states are in the same boat. Um, do they have authentic assessment? Does every school have portfolios? Are students putting in portfolios? Are we looking to see? Are children's strengths being identified? Have we put arts back in every school in music where they belong? because those are things that really, they even prove math scores, if you can believe that. So how do you get it, it's hard, it's hard. And you know, we have a lot of great superintendents and they have a lot of pressure on them and they're dealing with the crazy people too, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but you, you're gonna have to change how you hold them accountable. You can't leave in place what's been there and expect them to suddenly do things differently. So how are you going to measure success? How are we going to measure success as a state? And I think that's a very important question. And I think like healthcare, you've got a window of opportunity to deal with that. And if, if, if principal, if the superintendents know, well, we're going to give you, we're going to look at maybe strength of diploma like Louisiana, but why not add in strength of your creativity programs? Do you have maker spaces? Have you redone your library and put in a learnings common, commons? Um, are you doing Google 20% time? Are you having an innovation week? Are you doing things to spur innovation and creativity? And then how are you exhibiting that work? You know, we could have a, an online museum for the whole state of Georgia for all of the work of the first graders and the second. Give them a virtual bulletin board. These are things that you can do, um, but it's hard. Um, I just don't think that you can leave things like they are and expect things to be different just out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, they're held accountable. They have tough jobs. And right now, it's still all about test scores. It is. And that needs to change. Yes, we need a measure 
Some, some states have capped the number of testing days allowed. Pennsylvania, I believe Texas did it quite a few years back and said you're not allowed to pull them out and test more than X number of days. That is fantastic. Teachers in those states thought that was great because if you're testing one day out of five, when are you teaching? You look at how much, so many times these kids are being tested and a lot of them, you know, get testitis and get sick and don't come in because you get a lot of kids with test anxiety. They've already been so tested by the end of the year test, they're not gonna come. So um, we've got to shift from the focus on standardized testing and um, get creative and can we personalize learning and can we look at their strengths? We've got the capability with technology um, and we've got some fantastic people with resources in our state. Uh, we just need to start using them. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up with one final observation. I think once you bring it up is one of the challenges in education is there are so many cooks in the kitchen. In the K-12, you have the U.S. Department of Education, you have the governor of your state, you have the legislature of your state, you have the state school superintendent independently elected, you have the state board of education, you have a local board of education, and then you probably have an accrediting agency. So you have seven things running around setting policy and things, and then you have the poor teacher, and even the superintendent is kind of at the bottom of that hill. It's not quite as murky in the higher end, but you still have the Board of Regents, you have accrediting agencies, you have local presidents. Um, and so that is part of the challenge, your point, Lindsay, of how to it up together. Anyway, it was a great panel. I appreciate you guys being here, and I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you all so much. That was incredibly exciting, and, and you know, almost, it's exciting and frustrating, really, you almost have to blow up the whole thing. To, to make it work. But I think with people like this in charge, uh, hopefully we can come up with some good answers. Thank you to our, our staff and our, all our other speakers and our volunteers today. It's been a great day. Appreciate all of you coming out. Safe travels, and we are adjourned.